Hey guys, today we'll be discussing Plato's dialogue, Crito. This is a shorter and unassuming work, largely considered to be from Plato's earlier period. Narratively, it follows Socrates' trial in the Apology. However, there is not an argumentative or ideological consistency between the two. Whereas Socrates defended himself as the citizen in the Apology, in the Crito, Socrates takes the opposite approach, and makes the strongest possible case for the state and its laws. Despite it being one of Plato's shortest dialogues, the Crito is a little more mysterious than what a first impression or reading would perhaps lend you to believe. It is unclear why Plato wrote it, or what exactly he was trying to get across. The dialogue has a simple structure, and seems to go out of its way to avoid referencing more complex philosophical concepts, such as the soul. Various schools of thought have emerged in addressing this. Some scholars believe that Socrates modifies his arguments and style depending on the person he is talking to, in this case being the eponymous Crito. Crito was indeed not a philosopher, but rather a wealthy businessman and childhood friend of Socrates, which could perhaps explain the more restrained and tailored approach employed in the private conversation between the two men. Another more meta-idea, which may operate independent of or in conjunction with the previous, is the speculation that Plato specifically wrote the Crito as an introductory work for the general public. Whatever the case, in the modern day, most readers cast little more than a side-eyed glance at the work. I have not heard anyone defend much of what is said in it. As we shall soon discover, our modern conceptions of the individual, the nation-state, duty and law are quite different from the ancient Greeks. And so let us begin with the text. The dialogue begins with Socrates, waking up at dawn and finding his old friend, Crito, looking over him. Crito brings bad news. You see, Socrates has been held prisoner for about a month since his trial. There were no executions taking place in Athens until the return of one of the city's sacred ships, which Crito tells Socrates is expected to arrive later that day. So instead of Socrates dying the next day, which is the plan, Crito has come to convince him to escape. That Socrates is such a good friend, Crito is worried that the majority of people will think he abandoned Socrates if he does not help to break him out. People might think Crito cared more about his money than it did about Socrates. Socrates tells Crito not to worry about what the majority thinks, to which Crito replies that the opinion of the majority convicted Socrates and sent him here in the first place. Socrates brushes this off for now, and Crito launches into an impassioned articulation of all the reasons Socrates should escape. First of all, says Crito, Socrates' friends are not afraid of the consequences of aiding in his getaway, so that is of no concern. They also have plenty of money for bribes and transportation. Additionally, Crito has contacts in Thessaly, who will happily take care of and protect the condemned philosopher. But all that is just the means and methods. What about the justification? Well, Crito asserts that it would be unjust for Socrates to remain in captivity until his execution. He would be playing into the wicked designs of his enemies, especially in the face of the present opportunity to save himself. Furthermore, if Socrates stays, he would be deserting his sons. The good thing would be to look after their position in society. It would be shameful and cowardly, Crito utters, for both Socrates and his friends if they all just passively let him die. Time is running out and Socrates needs to make his final decision. Live or die, escape or perish. Socrates can appreciate Crito's zeal but only if it's exercised in pursuit of the correct outcomes. So, in an investigation of the correct way to act, Socrates wants to take a step back and return to Crito's earlier contention that one must pay attention to the opinions of the majority. Socrates starts by getting Crito to agree that people must naturally value some opinions and not others. This sets up a sort of dichotomy. How do we differentiate between opinions and decide which ones to consider? Socrates asks, one should value the good opinions, and not the bad ones? Crito answers, yes. The good opinions are those of wise men, the bad ones those of foolish men. Of course. To demonstrate this principle, Socrates brings up an example. Consider an athlete. Should they listen to the praise and instruction of their trainer, or to that of the broader crowd? Obviously, the athlete would be better off valuing the opinion of their actually knowledgeable trainer. To listen to the advice of randoms would probably result in a decreased performance, if not outright bodily harm. So to take it back to the matter at hand, of what is the just or unjust course of action, the only opinion that truly matters is from those knowledgeable of good. And this is a very serious matter. 
To be cajoled into doing wrong through popular pressure and coercion would corrupt the soul and make life not worth living. An important note here. Socrates never formally references the soul at all in the Crito, but its presence is clear and its extrapolation is all but automatic. As I alluded to before, the careful avoidance of the term soul may have been a matter of pragmatic simplification, but it is also possible that Plato is making some sort of subtle point in his omission. In any case, the overall conclusion of this line of thought is that Socrates and Crito are not necessarily obliged to value the opinions of the majority. Socrates then tasks Crito to examine the following statement in turn as to whether it stays the same or not. That the most important thing is not life, but the good life. It stays the same, replies Crito. And that the good life, the beautiful life, and the just life are the same, does that still hold or not? It does hold. That is, that it is better to die justly than to live unjustly. So the fundamental question here is whether it is just or not for Socrates to leave Athens and abscond his punishment. All the other arguments Crito made about money, reputation, and the upbringing of children are tertiary matters. From here, Socrates and Crito engage in a back and forth and establish that one must never willingly do wrong, one must not seek revenge for wrongs committed against them, and that doing harm is wrongdoing. To preview where Socrates is going with this, he intends to argue that escaping would in fact be harmful because it would be an unjustified and destructive affront to the law and perhaps to the city of Athens as a whole. Okay, for the rest of the dialogue here, Socrates gives a voice to and personifies the laws of Athens. Crito has pretty much been checked out since his initial speech, so Socrates is essentially monologuing, not as himself, but as the laws. This makes the presentation a little awkward for my style of delivery. I have elected to treat Socrates' portrayal of the laws as a separate character for the sake of clarity going forward. So Socrates offers a potential argument for his defense. The city wronged me, and its decision was not right. And the law's answer, was that the agreement between us, Socrates, or was it to respect the judgments that the city came to? In other words, the laws are suggesting that the process is legitimate, and Socrates agreed to it. He just doesn't like the particular outcome. Next, the laws engage in a series of questions and statements, critically challenging Socrates. Come now, what accusation do you bring against us in the city that you should try to destroy us? Do you think you have this right to retaliation against your country and its laws? That if we undertake to destroy you and think it right to do so, you can undertake to destroy us, as far as you can in return. Is your wisdom such as not to realize that your country is to be honored more than your mother, your father, and all your ancestors? We have given you birth, nurtured you, educated you. We have given you and all other citizens a share of all the good things we could. Even so, by giving every Athenian the opportunity, once arrived at voting age and having observed the affairs of the city and us the laws, we proclaim that if we do not please him, he can take his possessions and go wherever he pleases. We say, however, that whoever of you remains, when he sees how we conduct our trials and manage the city in other ways, has in fact come to an agreement with us to obey our instructions. The laws have just formulated an early rendition of the social contract, but really there have been two different but related arguments made here. Right, there is the idea that the individual consents to the authority of the state when they participate and benefit from it, but there is also the idea that the laws craft the citizen, that if the citizens are virtuous, it is because the laws are good and have made them so. In that sense, the systems of laws arranged to cultivate the just are inherently to be respected, and implicitly, the political orders that do not do that may be disregarded. So, is there absolutely no recourse if you disagree with the commands of a legitimate system of laws? Not quite but it is pretty constrained. The laws suggest that the citizen has two options, either persuade them to change their minds and do better, or to just do what they say. Socrates made his defense at the trial, the city ruled he broke the laws, and now he must face the consequences. The laws continue to speak to Socrates. He would not have dwelt here most consistently of all the Athenians if the city had not been exceedingly pleasing to you. Then at your trial you could have assessed your penalty at exile if you had wished, and you are now attempting to do against the city's wishes what you could have then done with her consent. 
right? If Socrates proposed exile as his punishment, instead of memeing about free meals, he likely would have gotten that rather than his present death sentence. However, Socrates made clear to the public that he had no desire to leave the city. You have had seventy years during which you could have gone away if you did not like us, and if you thought our agreements unjust. As it is, you depart, if you depart, after being wronged not by us, the laws, but by men. But if you depart after shamefully returning wrong for wrong, and mistreatment for mistreatment, after breaking your agreements and commitments with us, after mistreating those you should mistreat least, yourself, your friends, your country, and us, we shall be angry with you while you are still alive, and our brothers, the laws of the underworld, will not receive you kindly, knowing that you try to destroy us as far as you could. If Socrates escapes, he spits in the face of the laws, and will condemn himself in the eyes of the public. If Socrates was wrongfully convicted by men and refuses to break the law to get out of it, he is a martyr. If he leaves now, he will become the guilty man they say he was. In any case, if Socrates really does go ahead and sneak off to a place like Thessaly, he would be looked upon with suspicion there, as a person who picks and chooses which laws to follow. Socrates pauses and asks the silent Crito if he has any rebuttal to the law's arguments. I have nothing to say, Socrates, responds Crito. It is settled, then. The stronger reasoning has won. Socrates will stay and await his execution. Woo. The Crito is a strange one. I get the feeling that it would take a couple light historical mishaps, like Aristotle failing to mention it or something, for it to be considered fake. It is all just kind of unclear. Socrates appears to argue that it is never okay to break a just system of laws. But remember in the Apology, when he said he would never stop practicing philosophy, even if the jury and city said so? Are we to understand that the legitimacy of law rests on its dedication to virtue and goodness? Or does it become illegitimate when it pursues the opposite of those things? Who decides what is legal anyway? It is certainly tough, but what are your thoughts on those questions, or on the dialogue overall? Do you feel you owe any special obligation to your own laws? Alright, I will not keep you any longer. If you like this video, please do consider subscribing. Thank you for watching, I hope you have a good one. What the hell are you doing? P please stop! Don't read Plato. Don't read the Greeks. They've been debunked. Debunked. Debunked! Please, put the book down. Put. The. Book. Down. Things don't have to go this way. You don't have to read the classics. Please, just, just trust me, okay? They are debunked. There's nothing of value there. No, don't, don't open the page. There's nothing waiting for you there. Please. They are debunked. Don't you want me to... To buy you an introduction to modern philosophy instead? If, if that's not enough, if you really have to study the Greeks, then surely an abridged summary will- No! Please! Stop reading! They are debunked! Please, listen to me! Don't- Don't read it! Don't think about it! It's- It's pointless! It's- There's nothing to gain! Stop! No! Don't read Platonism! No! Ah!